When uh, Blanche says that I'm not exactly sure what I'm going to say, that's, that's literally true because I don't write out or plan my talk, uh, but I have a pretty good idea of what I'm going to say. Uh, so it will be about Baba and it will be about my meeting Baba. So uh, you needn't fear that it's going to be a far out talk on science fiction or something like that. Um, Blanche called me up a couple of days ago and asked if I wanted an introduction, and I thought, well, I really don't need an introduction because I think you'll probably feel after listening to this talk that you know as much about me or more about me than you really want to know personally because there's a heck of a lot of it in the talk, so uh, it really takes care of uh, any introduction. Um, I might also add, before I really get into it, that um, giving this talk about seeing Baba and what I learned from it has really been a very valuable learning experience for me over the years and it's taught me a lot of uh, important lessons. One of the big lessons it's taught me is that um, I really needed to put a lot of myself into the talk. At first when I started giving the talk after I'd met Baba and people were naturally interested, well what was it like to see Baba and so forth. I really excluded myself, my own background, my own interests, my own uh, likes and dislikes and problems and all of that, and I thought, you know, uh, people don't want to hear about that, they didn't come to hear about that, they really came to hear about Baba, so I abbreviated all of that and started talking about Baba, and realized that somehow it didn't really come across to people, it didn't mean to them what it meant to me. So I started gradually uh, putting more of myself in, and found that people could really relate to it because I found in telling all of that that you know Baba was really using me as an individual uh, to do a lot of work on and that there were a lot of valuable lessons that Baba taught me as an individual that had to do with my personality and my likes and dislikes and problems and background and all of that. Um, and I guess the second thing I've learned as a Baba lover is that uh, when I first met Baba, I was really charged up and I really believed that uh, the conversion of the masses was at hand, that since Baba had uh, seen me and because I had no more doubts about uh, God and love and Baba and the avatar and anything, that uh, pretty soon it was just a matter of maybe months or just a year or two before everybody became a Baba lover and Baba's love swept the world and the whole world would be saved from the problems and the mess that it's in. And uh, so I naturally thought of everybody as eager to hear everything about Baba and what he had to say and his books and his thinking and uh, so on and so forth. And I very quickly found out that uh, a lot of people don't want to hear about that, and those who do want to hear about that have a much better source than me, namely Baba's books and his discourses and so forth. And so I discovered in the course of giving this talk that it wasn't really my contribution or my place to uh, you know, elaborate on the discourses and the talks that Baba has given, uh, because you really can't improve on them. I mean, uh, there's just no way that that can be done. So it's really uh, been an experience of learning that uh, what I learned and uh, what I have to offer is really myself and the personal lessons that were involved in meeting Baba. So without much further ado, I'll give you a little uh, background uh, that I think you need to know uh, to see what Baba was doing and uh, how in his own inimitable and magnificent way, he accomplished uh, a miracle. Uh, the miracle of establishing in me a kind of faith in God and myself that I never had before I met Baba. Um, I'm about, what, 32, 33, and you know, grew up in a middle-class family in Denver, Colorado, and uh, my parents uh, were not uh, particularly religious. My mother is a very conscientious uh, Christian woman and you know, very sincere, but uh, I didn't have a heavy exposure to religion and it wasn't something that was uh, used to threaten me or involve me heavily in daily life. And uh, I think I quickly found that whatever 
Orthodox Church had to offer didn't uh, involve me that much, and uh, although as a child I was sort of always looking for something, I had no idea what I was looking for and certainly didn't think that I would ever find it in Orthodox religion. Um, I think as I remember back, one of the first significant experiences that I had, and I don't really remember uh, um, understanding it at the time, was uh, I met Rick Chapman, who many of you know, the fellow who takes care of Mayor Bob information, and uh, uh, many of you have met him personally. We were uh, together in high school, and I first met Rick in high school, and we felt a very natural rapport and friendship, and I remember thinking to myself that I felt, you know, a special relationship or connection with Rick, but I didn't know anything about karma or um, past lives or anything of that nature, so it didn't occur to me that uh, maybe we'd been friends before and maybe that was the explanation of uh, why I felt close to Rick. At any rate, his friendship was very valuable to me at that time, uh, because we both seem to be interested in, you might say, questions of a philosophical nature or trying to understand life and what that was all about and so forth. And not too many kids in high school in Denver, Colorado in the mid-50s were interested in those things. You know, the, uh, the happy days type of atmosphere really prevailed in my high school. Uh, kids were interested in having a good time and maybe kind of thinking where they would go to college, where they hoped they would have a good time and then get a job where they hoped they would have a good time. And uh, it, it wasn't heavy or intense or serious in the way that you know, the 60s uh, made us aware that uh, life can be. Um, so it was nice to have someone around who was at least interested in those kinds of things. Uh, it turned out later that Rick was to uh, really acquaint me with Mayor Baba and uh, for that I've always been very deeply grateful and have realized the importance of that special connection. Um, I guess there's not too much to say after that except that I got out of high school, went to college and uh, when I began college, I oh, this was in 1961, I had high hopes that although I didn't find what I was looking for in high school, I would find it in college because I imagined uh, the college and university community to be a very idealistic community of seekers after truth, people who really wanted to find out the truth of every uh, field of human activity and uh, of course we're interested in the truth of how to live and how to live rightly and how to live ideally and uh, that I would find a lot of people uh, who could teach me things about those subjects and from whom I could learn. And uh, I was uh, shocked to discover that uh, in many ways there was a lot of sort of mongering of knowledge and uh, grubbing for fellowships and uh, status and advancement that seemed to have very little to do with uh, living ideally and um, sort of how to improve one's own life and that kind of thing. Uh, so um, I never really found what I was looking for in college, and then at about that time, um, drugs came along, at least in my life, I don't know how prevalent they were, uh, although I was never one of the heavy uh, LSD takers, I never did have LSD, I did uh, take marijuana and uh, some peyote, I think, and uh, I think I honestly have to say that what drugs did for me, although Bob is very clear about what drugs do, and I certainly agree, is at least drugs uh, enabled me to believe that there was more to consciousness than we experience just in our everyday waking lives. Uh, and I really had a strong belief that that was true after taking drugs. Uh, and maybe uh, if that is the only purpose drugs ever had in my life, uh, they did con contribute something constructive. Uh, because I was convinced that there was something more to existence than just what we see and experience in daily life. And I was encouraged to look for it and try to find it. But I had no real idea of where to look and how and who to contact and this kind of thing. And the things at my disposal were really books and a few friends uh, who were interested in these kinds of things. So I started to read and talk and 
Uh, at that time, where I was going to school, there was a Gurdjieff group, and we got interested in Gurdjieff, and I realized that there were other people around, at least, who were interested in improving themselves and developing consciousness and becoming better people. And uh, I began to read about India, particularly, and at that time I had a friend who went to India and uh, became interested in India as a place, as well as India as a place where there were gurus and yogis and people like that who seemed to know a lot more about life. And I began to be interested in going to India, although I, I had not decided to go to India. So uh, I began to develop a feeling of excitement about the quest, the quest for higher consciousness, the quest for identity, the quest for something more in everyday life. It, because every step that I took and group that I saw and person that I met seemed to have something to offer and seemed to confirm the idea that there was something worth looking for. Uh, and I was discovering this in the face of people that I knew and respected telling me, there's no point in looking. You're never going to find anything more than everyday life, and you may as well adapt to it, accept it, and just do the best you can. I didn't believe that, and I seemed to find a lot of encouragement in the other direction, and I'm grateful for that. And now that I look back, I can see that there are people who ask these questions and who get the door slammed in their face and who get discouraged and they go back to whatever they were doing and they come to the conclusion, well, there really isn't anything more than just everyday life and you just have to make the best of it and that's that. And I see that uh, if Baba wants to shut the door, uh, he can shut the door. But if Baba wants to keep the door open, it's equally available to him to keep the door open and things turn out in your life that you meet certain people or read a certain book or have a certain experience that encourages you and you keep looking and you keep searching no matter what a lot of people are telling you and I was fortunate enough to have that experience in my life. Um, at some point I was just I thought idly traveling around and for some reason or other I happened to end up in New York in February of 1965 and uh, Nehru had just died somewhere in October or November of 1964. And the Indian community in New York City had decided to put on a kind of a memorial exhibit for Nehru and for the contribution that Gandhi had made to the Indian independence movement. And so they had rented two floors of a large skyscraper in New York City, and they had decorated it with pictures of India, and they had a... Uh, glass case which had exhibits from Gandhi's life and they had uh, sayings from Gandhi and Nehru and um, you know they just filled these two floors of this exhibit room with uh, lots of things of India and when I walked in there uh, I was entranced and a feeling simply came over me. Um, it wasn't unexpected or calculated or planned but a definite conviction arose within me that I not only wanted to go to India, but I had to go to India. I realized that whatever lay in my destiny, it was in India, and that it was imperative that I get there. Uh, it, wasn't, uh, it wasn't a harsh feeling, or it wasn't anything that I was afraid of, but, you know, it was a very beautiful feeling. It was like being called. I felt that I was called to go to India, and that I wanted to go to India, and that I knew whatever India had in store for me was absolutely going to be wonderful. And uh, I didn't know about Mir Baba then, uh, and I didn't knew, know what lay in front of me, but in hindsight I can see that my intuition at that moment was absolutely right in uh, more ways and in more beautiful ways than I could ever have dreamed of. So. I began to think, well, how could I go to India? And I had applied for a Fulbright scholarship and began to look around. And at that time, a friend of mine who had been to India came back and said, well, you can apply to the Peace Corps because they send a lot of people to India. And I said, well, anything to go to India. That was my only goal. I, w I would have worked on a ship or um, you know, walked over had I been able to do that. Just whatever was a means of getting to India was good. And so I decided to send in an application for the Peace Corps. I felt if they'd send me to India, it didn't really matter what I would end up doing because I knew that I would be happy in India. So uh, I sent an application for the Peace Corps and it takes them you know, several months to process it, so I just sort of forgot about it and continued going about my way. 
and uh, I got out of college, and I went home uh, to my parents in Denver, Colorado, and I was still at that stage, I was reading everything I could get, a, get my hands on. I was reading things about Gurdjieff, and I was reading things uh, about yoga, and I was reading things about Gandhi, and I was reading things about India, and occultism, and mysticism, and just anything that I could possibly lay my hands on. And um, I was home one day, and my friend Rick Chapman, who uh, had gone to California, uh, I didn't know that he had gone to talk to any Baba people, but I had known that he had gone to uh, a yoga conference here in the Los Angeles area. He had stopped off in San Francisco, where he had met with uh, Mersha Deuce, and Don Stevens was there, and there were two or three other people from Sufism Reoriented there at the time. And um, Phyllis will probably remember this. Uh, back in 1965, uh, Baba had his Sahavas for Easterners, I think, in April or May. And he was promising a Sahavas for Westerners. It was going to be at Christmas time in 1965. And at this point in the summer, the Westerners were all making plans to fly either from Los Angeles or from New York City to see Baba sometime at Christmas time. Uh, in India, and they were all eagerly looking forward to this because they had not had the chance to see Baba since 1962 at the East-West Gathering, and they missed him terribly, and they wanted to see him. And so uh, the Baba lovers told Rick about this, and Rick was excited, and I think he even bought a ticket on the plane, and he was, you know, ready to go, and he asked the yoga people if they knew anything about Baba, and they said, no, but you don't need Baba, you just yoga is fine. And, uh, so uh, he didn't, wasn't too impressed by that because he thought, well, you know, here's a, a living master who has written all these books and he has all these followers here and he must know something. He's at least worth seeing, at least worth the price of a plane ticket. And uh, so he was very excited about that. And he came back to Denver. This was in July of 65. And uh, he told me about Bala. Now, m my thinking at this time was that I began to be uh, concerned that, you know, I was really not only on the fringe, uh, but, you know, that I was flipping out, that uh, I would sit down and talk to people about my interests in mysticism. And in the early 60s, uh, mysticism wasn't widely accepted, even in the college community. Uh, and, you know, people I knew who wanted to be professors or scientists or doctors or whatever, you know, would look at me as if, you know, well, this is a sign that not only are you flipping out, but you'll never amount to anything. I mean, it's just you're going to be one of those people who meditates in a cave and chants your little mantra and, you know, that's it for you, kid. Uh, and I began to be concerned that, you know, maybe all this mysticism that I was looking into would just drive me over the brink. I would go crazy and uh, I, I simply wouldn't be able to cope with everyday life. And I began to think, well, if the only thing that mysticism does for me is to make me go nuts and I won't be able to live an ordinary life, then uh, that's not going to really help me and I, I'm afraid of that and so on. And, you know, these were the concerns that I had. And so uh, when Rick met me, he was really excited, and the first book he showed me was The Wayfarers. And he said, you know, here's, here's this exciting spiritual master, and uh, he knows everything, and he's written God Speaks, and uh, all the discourses, and he's alive, and not only is he alive, but he's going to see all his Western followers, and you, you can go too, and aren't you excited? And I looked at Chadi Baba and Cha Cha and all these guys, and I thought, well, if, if this is what he does to his followers, you know, this is, I, I don't know if I want to join up, you know. Uh, so, uh, you know, my mother had enough problems with my coming home and saying that I didn't want a hamburger because I was a vegetarian. I mean, God help her if I came home in rags, uh, you know, and, and went, uh, so uh, I was very cautious, but at the same time I was open enough to start reading uh, Baba's books, and I was extremely impressed. Uh, it seemed to me that more than any other writer and uh, uh, master, Baba spoke with more authority and seemed to know more of what he was talking about than anybody, and I was just knocked over about that aspect of what Baba had to say.
and so I was very impressed. But at the same time, I, I was looking for a group that I could get involved in, or a teacher, or a guru, or something that I could really go and stay with, and I didn't see anything in what Baba had to say that was an invitation to come and be with him and let him be my master and my teacher and get involved in this group. And so it seemed that Baba was a wonderful and dynamic and interesting master, but, and maybe you could go see him once every four years, but I didn't understand how you could follow him and have him be your master and all of that. So uh, it, it just didn't occur to me that I would become committed to him as my master and be a Baba lover and so on and so forth. So, as it turned out, I got into the Peace Corps and into a Peace Corps training program and uh, so on and so forth. And so I was destined to go to India. Um, I was not, I didn't think of myself as going to India to see Meher Baba, uh, although it turned out that I would say that is the only reason that I went to India. But I say that with the wisdom of hindsight and not because it was anything that I knew or suspected at that time. Uh, so I was in this training program, and I think the first thing I remember learning that had to do with Baba in this training program was that uh, Mir Baba had canceled the Sahavas that he had been planning. He said his work was very intense, and he was tired, and it was necessary to cancel it. Uh, but he said to his lovers, this was in a family letter sometime in September of 1965, I will meet with my lovers somewhere, somehow, sometime. Now, no one suspected at that point that Baba would drop his body before he met his lovers again, and no one suspected that somewhere, somehow, sometime meant I will meet you not in the body, but uh, in my spiritual body, and uh, I will give you my love and my darshan and my blessing uh, in that way, uh, because we all felt that Baba was simply postponing his work for a little while, and that Sometime, maybe six months later, uh, he would again invite the Westerners over because this was characteristic of Baba. Ever since the 20s, when Baba began collecting disciples, he was always setting up some project and then canceling it, saying, oh no, the time isn't right, my work won't permit it, I can't go through with that Sahavas, I can't see those people, I can't go to that town, um, I can't go to that country, uh, don't have those people come at this time. And so the making of plans and the changing of plans was characteristically Baba, and no one suspected that uh, those, by and large, who hadn't seen him since 1962 were not going to be able to see him again, which was characteristic of the majority of American Baba lovers in 1965. And I think another characteristic of American Baba lovers in 1965 is that uh, the great... Uh, coming of the young people had not started, uh, because by and large the Baba lovers of the early 60s were the tried and true staunch Baba lovers of the 50s and 40s. You know, there were people like Phyllis and Elizabeth Patterson and Kitty Davy and uh, the Winterfelts and uh, the Mercia de Deuce and Don Stevens and all the people who had been with Baba through thick and thin in the 40s and the 50s and uh, the 60s. and uh, through that period of time, the number of Baba lovers hadn't really increased. There was this core of people who were really dedicated to Baba and working for Baba, uh, but uh, Baba didn't have this great appeal uh, to large numbers of young people that he's had in the last uh, eight or ten years. Uh, and so it was kind of a novelty at this point in 1965 for the older Baba lovers to see the younger kind of college-age uh, kids get interested in Baba, because Baba had hinted that there would be lots of people coming, but they didn't really know from what sector of the culture these people would come. Uh, you know, perhaps they thought, well, maybe the theosophical groups will somehow get interested in Baba, and it'll be those people that we're dealing with and this type of thing. But it, it turned out to be, you know, the younger generation. Um, and at those times, you know, young people seriously inquiring about Baba was not only a novelty, but a welcome experience. You know, Kitty Davy didn't have that many people pounding down the door trying to get a place at Mayor Center and talk to her about Baba, as, you know, since then she's had hundreds and maybe thousands of people. So uh, everybody, you know, got a real royal red carpet treatment, uh, which was true of people who contacted the Winterfelts in those days and Mayor Spiritual Center and Sufism and so forth. Um, so there did seem to be an 
air about the Baba Lovers, a real special excitement and special love, and uh, I was impressed by that. Um, but so this, this family letter came, well, Baba's not going to have his sahavas, uh, so I thought, well, he'll have it, I'm going to be in India for two years, and uh, I'll just keep in touch, and when he does, I'll arrange to go see him, and, and that'll take care of me. And uh, I just wasn't too concerned. Um, now, I knew a fellow in Boston at that time named Robert Dreyfus, who a lot of you probably know. And he was another of our group who was very interested in mysticism. And uh, he was intensely interested in Baba. And he had decided to go to the East because he felt the West was not spiritual and because he felt he finished up college. So it was, it was time to go and do what he wanted to do, which was to search for truth. Well, at that time, uh, he also felt that uh, drugs could be a legitimate part of spiritual activity, and he took some drugs with him, not really questioning that there might be anything spiritually improper about this. It just seemed natural. Um, but since he had set out not on the plane where the other Baba lovers were going to see Baba, but hitchhiking, which was his way of traveling, uh, he didn't get the message uh, in the family letter. And so all during this time that Baba lovers were brokenhearted and they couldn't go and see Baba and they were making new plans, our friend Robert Dreyfus was hitchhiking over to India. Uh, he was going through the Middle East, and he finally took a boat from Kuwait over to Bombay, and then hitchhiking all along, and so forth. So during this period of time, one actor in the drama uh, was Robert Dreyfus, who was hitchhiking to India. So that took up a couple of months of his time. Well, in the meantime, as I look back, these various things that I've handed to you in my life were things which I see that Baba placed in my life to bring me to him. I remember the very day that I met him, Baba had me go round Pune with Jal, and Jal said, uh, it was clear to me then, for the first time, that Baba had placed these steps in my life so that I could take one step and one step and one step and one step toward him. And Jal said, well, if Baba wants you, he gets you. And I see that this was his way of getting me, is making sure that at every step in the journey, uh, there was another step to go to, and that step was another step toward him. <coughs> so one thing <laughs> excuse me, that happened to me in the Peace Corps is that I began to be, get very disillusioned with the Peace Corps. And I thought, well, I, I don't want to go. Uh, I don't like the Peace Corps well enough to stay in the program. I'm willing to drop out and do something else. But that would have meant that I did not go to India, and so Baba had to solve that problem. Well, it appeared to me that what was happening was that I got romantically involved with one of the other uh, Peace Corps, one of the other girls in the Peace Corps, uh, and uh, so it seemed to me that this solved my problem. Uh, and I thought, you know, this is true love and all of this. And uh, as I look back now, it was, you know, Baba is such a master psychologist that he knows exactly how to communicate uh, at your level and in your interest, and if this is what you're open to, and if this is what you think is happening, it will happen, but maybe not for the reasons you think it's happening. And in that case, I thought, well, true love has found me, and this is it, and uh, so on and so forth. It wasn't anything like that. It was simply uh, another of Baba's wonderful steps and devices to keep me interested in the Peace Corps, to keep me on track and go to India. And as it turned out, sort of once I got on the plane to go to India, um, the romance began to cool so that at a certain point in India, it not only cooled, but it became ice. Uh, and, you know, it's a uh, characteristic of Baba that if he wants to give you a message, he can do so on your level, whatever that level is. Uh, and that, you know, happened to be my level of interest at that particular time, and uh, he wanted to give me a message. So that kept me in the Peace Corps. I was there, and I was still on track. And then I think the next significant event that I can identify uh, that had to do with my trip to see Baba uh, was a message that we got from Robert Dreyfus. He sent a postcard back that he had met Baba. Now this seemed to be very interesting because Baba not only had told his lovers, well, I'm 
not going to have the sah sahavas, don't bother to come. But he also said, I am in seclusion. I need to be in seclusion to do my work, so please leave me alone. You know, don't communicate with me unless you absolutely have to. And this was said to the older Baba lovers, many of whom had enjoyed privileges of correspondence and telegrams and all sorts of things. So this was no small uh, potatoes that Baba would say, hey, you know, I love you dearly, but, you know, try to restrict your contact with me and don't write me unless it's absolutely necessary. I have to be alone to do my work. Uh, so I thought, well, if the avatar says he wants to be alone, he means he wants to be alone. And it didn't seem to me that somebody could just break into the seclusion and meet him. And I was really curious as to how this fellow Robert Dreyfus had broken through the seclusion, which I literally took as seclusion, to see Baba. But, and this is another example of how Baba can communicate to you on whatever level you find yourself. It also aroused in me a great feeling of competition. Well, um, you know, here we are, young people, we're starting off on our spiritual quest, and who is this fellow to be any better than I? I mean, he had this chance to meet Mayor Baba, and if he can do it, I can do it, so I should at least try to meet Mayor Baba. So I resolved at that point in my mind that when I was in India, I would try to meet Mayor Baba. If Robert Dreyfus could do it, I could do it, and I wanted to try. I didn't want to be outdone. So. Uh, the Peace Corps program ended, and I began to be confronted with a practical problem. I was going to India, well, how was I going to see Baba? I didn't even know his address or uh, how I went about contacting him. Did he have a phone? Did he have an address? Did I just walk up to the front door? Uh, did I have to go through, you know, several level, levels of people to meet him, and so on and so forth. So I wrote both to Sufism, where I'd been buying my books, and I also wrote to Don Stevens, because Robert Dreyfus had met Don Stevens, who also got to see Baba in seclusion, not only that particular time, but many others. And uh, he was back in the States, and I felt, well, since he just saw Baba, maybe I'll write to him and ask him how I can go about seeing Baba. So, I got a very sweet letter back from Carrie Harb, who was working at the Sufi Center at that time, and she, she and Joseph had also just come back from India, where they had lived for a while, uh, in Pune and spent a lot of time with Baba and for health reasons it was necessary for them to come back to the States and so they knew a lot about what Baba's activities were and who to see and all this and they said well you should write to Adi Irani uh, because you know he will know what to do they gave me Adi's address and then Don Stevens was kind enough to call my home only I had just left to get on the plane to go to New York to go to India about you know an hour before he called but when I discovered this I was very touched, and I was also very excited because it seemed to me that this Baba must really have something if somebody in California can call my house at his own expense in Denver, Colorado, and he had never met me, he didn't know me from Adam, and the only thing he knew about me was that I was going to India and I wanted to see Mayor Baba. Why, if he's willing to take that trouble and expense, this Mayor Baba must be somebody very, very exciting and important and worth meeting. And I was also touched by the love that these people had because they were genuinely interested in my seeing Baba and excited about my seeing Baba and hopeful that I would see Baba. And uh, Don, you know, wrote in, in his letter, which he sent over to India, um, if you do succeed in seeing Baba, he also suggested that I write to Adi, you know, please let me know one day because I'm very interested. So I... I did go to India. The romance that I thought was a romance turned out to be <clears throat> just a friendship and cooled uh, down to less than that after a while. And um, I realized that it was just a device to get me to India. And when I got to India, I was extremely excited about being in India. Uh, I can't explain it. it just, there were just feelings that came over me about being in India that were feelings of great excitement and anticipation. And I began to experience things that I hadn't experienced since I was four and five years old. Uh, the tremendous kind of excitement that little kids have before a birthday party or before Christmas or before going to somewhere that's special. And the whole world is rosy and everything is good and you know what's going to happen to you is wonderful. And all of those feelings, uh, I mean, I was just overwhelmed with a spontaneous feeling that whatever it's going to be, it's going to be great absolutely great and very, very special. 
Uh, and I had that feeling uh, a lot uh, during the months that I was in India before I saw Bala. I also had feelings of great depression at other times, which I couldn't understand or explain. It seemed as if I were on a, an emotional pendulum, and it was either very, very high or very, very low, and there wasn't sort of anything very ordinary. So um, I got in India, I got settled, and then I wrote to Adi. This was, uh, oh, sometime late January of 1966. At that time, Baba was in Merizad, Adi was in Ahmednagar, and Baba was still in seclusion. And I wrote to Adi, and I just gave him some background on myself, and uh, I asked to see him, and uh, Baba said, uh, through Adi, uh, that he was glad to learn that I was in India, and he sent me his love, and would I please, you know, write to him uh, on, uh, I think it was uh, February 10th, uh, and renew my request, and that at that time he would respond to it. And uh, so I began to feel, well, this is uh, Baba putting me to a test because I'd always felt, well, you know, the master puts the disciple to the test, but I'd always en envisioned something really heavy, like, well, if you really want to see me, you've got to realize there are thousands of people out there who want to see me, you know, why don't you go to the Himalayas and fast for four weeks and then walk around India on your hands and knees, and after you've done that, I'll realize that you're serious and you can come see me. Uh, but here he was giving me something that, you know, was very simple. Just, would I please write a letter and put it in the mailbox on the 10th of February? Well, I could do that, and I did do that, and I remember feeling, well, so, uh, you know, he's giving me a test, but uh, I'm smart, I know what he's doing. And uh, so I did that, and uh, I got another letter back from Adi. It said, um, Baba has this said the letter of February 10th, which you did well to send Baba on that day, was received by Baba and read out to him, and Baba is pleased to tell you that he can see you. Uh, and I remember thinking that just, it was overwhelming that Mayor Baba would want to see me, because I felt, at this point in my life, I'd been searching and searching, and I really hadn't found what I'd been looking for, and at this point, my whole life was just focused on this search. Uh, because there was nothing else that interested me. The only thing that interested me was this search. And I, all of my energy was concentrated on finding something that I felt was meaningful and finding a direction for my life to go. And because I didn't really feel useful, I felt that I didn't have anything to offer to Mayor Baba, and uh, so it overwhelmed me that Baba could write saying that he would be pleased to see me, because I felt, well, what in the world can I possibly offer to him? I, of course, am pleased to see him, but how can he be pleased to see me? And uh, so he said uh, he wanted to see me, uh, and I had also requested uh, my friend in the Peace Corps uh, to be able to see him, and he said he would see us both in uh, Pune, uh, but he wanted to see us only for five minutes. And, of course, that was fine with me. Uh, Any time was fine with me. And he said I should write him again when my vacation plans became clear and we could set it up. Um, so I, uh, I think either that time or in another piece of correspondence, you know, uh, Baba said that I should write him at a specific time. Uh, and it later turned out that I was not able to write to Baba at that specific time, and I began to get very worried because I felt, well, if Baba told me to write him at the specific time and I'll be traveling around and I won't have a mailbox or anything and I, w I won't know what to do and maybe I won't get to see him and I was very, very anxious. Well, now I look back and I can see a lesson that Baba used for his lovers, uh, which was this was simply another chance to contact him. And Baba did this very frequently. Plans came up. They had to be changed, and you had to go back to Baba and discuss it with Baba. Well, all of these opportunities, instead of being something traumatic, oh, uh, changed plans, uh, it's a hassle, it's a worry, are looked at from the other point of view. Great, it's another chance to ask Baba about something. It's another chance to have contact with Baba. In hindsight, I can see it this way, but at the time, I wasn't able to see it that way. So Baba wrote back, and he said, uh, since you'll be traveling and you won't be able to write me, I'll give you two dates. You can come April 8 at 9 a.m. for five minutes only, or you can come April 15 at 9 a.m. for five minutes only. 
Uh, you pick one or the other and write me a couple of days in advance to let me know which one. So I thought, great, you know, he's committed himself, he's taken a load off my mind, and that's great. Well, from the moment I knew that Baba was going to meet me, I, I felt a happiness that is indescribable. Um, as a kid, I was always a big baseball fan, and I played on kids' baseball teams, and I really loved baseball. And there was one touching moment uh, in the history of baseball that I always remembered is where Lou Gehrig, who'd been a great baseball star for the Yankees, developed a disease which turned out to be terminal, which is sometimes referred to as Lou Gehrig's disease, it's where the muscles atrophy and so forth. And uh, after he realized that he was going to die, and uh, it was a very sentimental occasion, they, they gave a sort of a fan's day for him in Yankee Stadium, and the place was packed. And, he gave a very emotional speech, and it was very positive, in which he seemed to have courageously accepted his death, and he stood before all these people, and he said, uh, I consider myself the luckiest man on the face of the earth. Uh, and somehow I thought about that when I was in India at this time, because those words described the feeling that I had, because I began to think, of all the Baba lovers in the West who were in the West and couldn't see Baba, and all the Baba lovers, and all the people who didn't even know about Baba, but if they knew about Baba, would wish they knew about Baba, and that type of thing. And I thought, of all those billions of souls, I was the one who was going to get to see Baba. And I honestly and truly felt that I was the luckiest man on the face of the earth. And um, those weren't just words or a nice memory or a touching talk that somebody gave in Yankee Stadium. They were the way that I felt, not just for a moment or for five minutes, but every day for weeks. And uh, in addition to feeling that way, I also felt uh, an inability to worry. Um, Don Stevens talks about this in the introduction to God Speaks. He said, after he met Baba in 52, Something happened to him. Baba had performed psychological surgery on him, and for a while, he wasn't able to worry. He tried. He brought out those pet anxieties and those pet worries, and he rolled them around in his mind, and he tried to work up a frenzy, but he couldn't do it. And the same thing happened to me. I just didn't have the capacity to worry. And I realized by experience, and I don't say this is the result of any accomplishment on my part, but purely the result of his grace and the honeymoon period of coming to him, that everything Baba says about worry is absolutely right. That it destroys your happiness, it destroys your ability to enjoy life, it wastes your energy, and if you didn't worry, life would be wonderful. And my life was wonderful, not because of anything external that was happening, because I was just walking around India, I didn't have that much money, I didn't have very many friends, I wasn't doing anything special, I didn't have a career, I wasn't achieving anything, didn't have any name, fame, or any of those things. And in fact, a lot of the things that were happening were ridiculous. I was living with a bunch of Peace Corps volunteers who couldn't stand me, and this one woman wouldn't even come to meals when I came because she hated my guts. and. Uh, <laughs> The administration was frustrated with me because I wouldn't fit in and they couldn't find a place for me to fit in. And, you know, it was just endless trouble and hassle in my external life. But my inner life for, for these few weeks was divinely blissful because I couldn't worry. And it just seemed that was, it was proof that, you know, the kingdom of heaven is within and that if you really conquer that old demon of worry, life is happy. And it's just exactly what he's always said. Uh, but I never had the ability to do it, but by his grace at that time I realized it and he's, he's really, you know, really, really right. And so it was a very happy period for me spiritually. And one of great anticipation because I thought about Baba all the time. That's all I thought about is that I was going to see Baba and I was fortunate and I was happy and I knew everything was going to be taken care of and everything was going to be right. So I had incredible experience after another just uh, in the couple of weeks before I saw Baba. I realized that my vacation plans made it necessary to select April 15th and later, uh, like about eight years later, I realized that that itself was a joke uh, but because Baba has this marvelous 
sense of humor. It was a joke that I didn't get till many years later, and that made me realize that Baba has probably planted millions of jokes in this avataric cycle that we, none of us will get until 500 years from now or a thousand years from now because that's just the way his marvelous sense of humor works. I mean, he just throws all these things in and if we're not sophisticated enough to get it, he doesn't worry because at some time in the future we'll wake up and say, oh God, that's it, you know, that's funny, but I was so dense I didn't see it. But, you know, that's, that's one thing uh, that he threw out and it turned out I saw him on the 15th. So I was traveling around and uh, I was in uh, Delhi, I think, on the 11th or 12th. The 15th was a Friday, and I was in Delhi on a Tuesday. And uh, I, I, I was so innocent about India, and I was so happy, and I wasn't worrying about anything. And I, I, didn't, I wasn't practical either. And I didn't realize that April in India is the marriage season, and the trains are often booked up, and people go into weddings here and there, and you can't get a seat, and why try, and that type of thing. Never occurred to me that I couldn't get a seat on a train uh, until I tried to get from Delhi to Bombay. And it had not been for the intervention of an Indian friend who knew exactly what to do at the railroad stations, who to talk to, and the exact language to talk, whether it was uh, Hindi or Gujarati or Marathi or um, whatever it was, he knew, uh, and he was able to finagle me a seat. Uh, but had it not been for that helpful and friendly intervention, I probably wouldn't have gotten from Delhi to Bombay. I did, and I got a place to stay, and then the next day, which was Thursday, I got a train from Bombay to Pune, and uh, that's where Baba stayed in the three hot months in India, the April, May, and June. Baba and the Mandali always went to Pune to stay at what used to be the what they call the bungalow of the Maharani Shantadevi of Baroda, uh, which they've now torn down and they just have some apartment houses there and a little memorial to Baba, but um, it seemed like a palace to me, although the Indians kept calling it a bungalow, but it, it, was, it, was, a, it was a beautiful, beautiful place. Um, my, my memories of it are, are very precious and very beautiful. Um, so I went to Pune and uh, I, was, I was concerned about a couple of things. One, I was concerned that I didn't know Pune, I didn't know how to get there, so I wanted to make sure I knew how to get there, so I asked, you know, at the desk how to get there, so I got that into me, how to get there. And then I was also concerned because Baba had been precise in all these letters. I mean, he would say, at 9 a.m. sharp, um, five minutes only, and it seemed that Baba was very, very particular about time. And uh, now I know that Baba was very particular about time, but... I was concerned that I didn't want to oversleep or be late or not know how to get there and show up too late and have Baba say, well, I kept telling you in all those letters that I would see you at 9 a.m. for five minutes only and that you should be there at 9 a.m. sharp. And you, you showed up at 10, that's too late. I've got a lot of things to do and a lot of people to see. Uh, you're not on the schedule for uh, anything past 9.05. So I was, you know, quite worried that this would happen even though I wasn't worried about a lot of things in my life. I was worried about this one particular thing. And so I arranged for the boy at the desk to come up and wake me up, and I went to bed real early and all of this. And uh, fortunately, I woke up in time and uh, got up and got dressed and had some breakfast and managed to go over to the Bun Garden area. Uh, phenomenally excited. Uh, not even knowing what to expect, because I hadn't really thought about it, and I never really thought about what was going to happen until about two minutes before I saw Bala. I was just so excited and so elated. I knew it was going to be good, and I was happy. And I knew it was going to solve every problem that I'd ever had, and I was just higher than a kite. You know, I was floating. And so I went over and <coughs> went to this kind of Indian-type hotel, and this guy was there smiling, and he had pictures of all the gurus and saints uh, I, that I had ever heard of and dozens that I had never heard of. And uh, he was there, he was happy. And so I asked him how to get to 24 Bun Garden Road and he said, oh, that's Mayor Baba's bungalow. And I said, yes, I know that. And he said, well, um, this is down there. And he said, well, the boy here will show you. So um, this little kid who spoke only Marathi got out his bicycle and he walked alongside me until I was at the gate, uh, Guru Prasad had a large gate out in front and then you went in the gate and you went, you know, for a, a good stretch uh, just 
on the grounds before you got to the veranda outside and then there was the bungalow inside. And so he let me off at the gate and the gate was open and, uh, and then the boy got on his bike and rode away. And uh, so I was there and I think just after the boy left and I took my first footsteps into the grounds of Guru Prasad, I experienced really, I guess you would say Baba's presence, but in the form of peace. I mean, I really experienced a peace that existed, had nothing to do with me. It was just, it was there, it was real, and the Bible speaks of a peace that passes understanding, and I experienced it, and I was, it was joyful, and it was happy, and I knew that this had to be a place uh, where something very holy would happen. And I walked in, and uh, there was such stillness about Guru Prasad that even the tree uh, seemed to have very, very little motion in the leaves. The wind was just very, very faint, and there was just a complete stillness to the place. And there was a gardener over to one side, but he didn't pay any attention to me, and so I kept walking. And finally, I saw a fellow on the veranda who waved at me and sort of told me to motion me to sit down in this place. And I remember thinking, well, I mean, he, he expects me, uh, but, you know, here's this fellow walking around, he's got a pair of pants on and an undershirt. Now, how, how can this fellow be in the presence of the master just walking around in his underwear? I mean, sir, this, isn't the, this isn't the way you, you, you dress, you know, with him. I didn't, I didn't expect, you know, something really fancy, but I expected something a little more dressy than that, so I thought, well, it was... This a little jarred my expectations, uh, which wasn't the first thing that happened that day to jar my expectations. But so he came over, and um, I, I really had a, a very intense curiosity about the mana because I had not met any Baba lovers in India uh, at that time. This was the first experience that I'd had with any Baba lovers, and uh, this was Erich who came out to see me, and uh, yeah, he. I was very curious as to see what Baba did to his disciples because it seemed to me that that was a measure of what he would do to me and that's one way that I could tell whether or not I wanted to be committed to him. Um, and not, I was feeling happy and that was great, I was all for that, but I was, you know, I had this question in my mind, if I give my life to this man, what am I going to be like 40 years from now, you know? Uh, am I going to be, you know, nuts or just, you know, one of these fruity spiritual people who wander around and can't do anything or, you know, but I saw Erich and, you know, I was really impressed. He was uh, not only the warmest person that I had ever met, but, you know, he was also sincere and genuine and really solid. And I, you know, I felt, you know, great. I mean, if he can do that for this guy, uh, you can do that for me. I'm fine. <laughs> Sign me up. So, um, went in and Erich didn't say much. He had expected me. And the Mandali with Baba there are definitely different from the way the Mandali are now when Baba isn't there and they meet the Westerners. Um, there were not a lot of words or conversation or sit down, let's talk, you know, where have you come from, blah, blah. It was, hello, uh, you've come to see Baba, Baba's in there, well, you know, and, and Erich's mind was really on, you know, Baba's in there, it's necessary to serve Baba, do what Baba wants, get back to Baba, uh, and accommodate me with the least expenditure of energy. So I was there, he welcomed me, but didn't waste a lot of energy and brought me up, had me sit down, gave me a copy of the photo book which described the 65 Sahavas for Easterners, told me I could look that over. And then Erich went out of the room and back to Bala. And uh, a couple of people came in, uh, Rano Gailey came in and said hello, and uh, Mani came in, and I was extremely impressed by Mani. I, I, I was just knocked off my feet by her spontaneity and her love and all the wonderful qualities that she has. And I was looking at this picture book and I couldn't really focus on it because then I started thinking, well, time's getting close and what's Baba going to do? Uh, I, I, uh, I, I'd only prepared one thing. I hadn't really thought of questions or anything like that and I hadn't really thought, well, what's he going to do to me and what should I do in response and all this. Uh, I had written Baba a little poem because I wanted to give Baba something and I felt that that was the only thing really unique that I had to offer. So I had this little poem, but that's about the only thing. And I was worried, well, does he want me to bow down or do all these things the Easterners do? And uh, so finally Erich came into the room, and as we were walking down the hall to see Bala, uh, Erich said, 
You know, Baba doesn't want you to uh, bow down to him or touch his feet or anything like that, uh, but he may embrace you. And so I felt, you know, this is great. It was almost as if, you know, Baba had made me comfortable, you know, in the, in the perfect way. He had perceived something about me that was uncomfortable and he just removed it completely. And which is Baba's way, that he doesn't want anything to interfere with a relationship between the lover and the master when they're there. If, uh, if you're hungry, your thoughts are not really going to be focused on him. So he wants you to have that taken care of. If you're tired and sleepy, your thoughts are not going to be really focused on him because you'll be thinking, I'm tired, I'm sleepy, maybe I should go to bed. And Baba wants that taken care of, so you'll be free to focus on him. So he wants to clear away all this rubbish so that you'll be completely relaxed and have energy to focus on him. And this is exactly what Baba was doing. You know, rituals and bowing down and kneeling and touching feet are not the essence of the relationship between the master and the disciple. If they make you uncomfortable, if they make you self-conscious, if they make you think about yourself, then they're an interference and Baba gets rid of them. What he wants is for you to focus on him completely and to love him and to do what he wants. And all this other stuff is really extraneous. And you know, that was a really good lesson that Baba taught me, although at the time I wasn't thinking of it as a lesson, but in retrospect I can see it as such. So we left our sandals there at the door, and uh, Erich uh, went into the room, and uh, no, Erich was with me, and he opened the doors, and uh, Baba was sitting in the little room to the side of Guru Prasad where he met with the men, there were only men in the room, and uh, Erich opened the doors, and I didn't expect to see Baba sitting right there, but he was there, and it kind of took me by surprise. And uh, I was standing there, and uh, Baba looked at me, and I sort of, oh, what do I do now? You know, uh, I didn't expect this, and uh, so, you know, Baba just looked at me, and he went like that, you know, come in. And uh, so, the minute Baba did that, um, all my thinking about, well, what do I do, what do I say, all this just sort of went completely out the window. I felt a tremendous magnetic wave of love from all around me that was really drawing me to Baba. Baba opened his arms, he drew me to him, to him and uh, I remember, I hadn't thought about embracing Baba, uh, but I remember feeling how natural it was and how natural Baba made me feel about embracing him. He just radiated so much love that it seemed to be the natural thing for him to do. And uh, to touch Baba was to touch someone whose body was really light. I'm not thinking so much in the physical sense, although even though Baba in his pictures looks, you know, lion-like a lot and strong and powerful and big, his physical body was not that big. Uh, but to touch him was not just... Uh, something that, you know, was like touching a small body, but I mean light in the sense of not weighed down or really attached to his body.